Hello. Thank you for making the choice to join us here at the Greenbrier Church Online. As I was studying for our text this morning, I came across a story from Tony Evans, who ministers in Dallas, Texas. He said that one day he was at the gym and he noticed a woman walk into the gym. She had on the workout attire. She had a headband on and wristbands on, and she had her headphones in listening to music. She had a water bottle. She walked over to the side of the gym and she started to warm up. She did a couple stretches. She bent from side to side. She moved her arms around. She shook her hands out. And then she walked over to the dumbbell rack. She picked up two dumbbells and started to get her breathing right. And she began to do bicep curls. And after doing five reps, she puts the dumbbells back down on the rack. She grabs her towel, throws it over her shoulder. She takes a selfie and then she walks out. Tony Evans said that when she walked in, she looked the part. She, she looked like she was there to work out. But if you show up, you do one rep, you take the selfie, and then you head out the door, you're not really there to work out, are you? You're really just there to be seen. Mr. Evans says, in the same way, if you show up to a church dressed in your Sunday best, Bible in hand, bow your head to pray, sing all of the songs, and then walk out the door and forget to think about God for the rest of the week, then you really didn't show up to worship, did you? You just showed up to be seen. I don't know anybody in my life that would claim that they were a lukewarm Christian. But I do know an awful lot of people that if you were to ask them about their eternal salvation, they would hem and haw and stutter and stammer and finally say, you know, I'm just not really sure if I'm going to go to heaven. That's what I find so powerful about what Paul says in the text that we're reading today. He's encouraging us to just not show up looking the part. He encourages us to get involved in the process. Now, I understand that for many people, this is a difficult part of Paul's letter. I've been told that this part of the letter is a some grace theology where where you see God as some stern taskmaster that no matter how hard we try, no matter what all we do, we'll never be able to please Him. And when we fail, and trust me, we're going to fail early and often, God's going to zap us with, financial disasters or physical distress or show his contempt for us in some way. So out of our fear, we just work harder and harder trying to please God in understanding that he'll never really be happy with us. You know, that's the God of the Pharisees and the scribes. That's the God that would cause someone to look at someone who was blind and ask, Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents? But this is not our God. This is not our God who reveals himself through the scriptures because the God that we read about in the Bible is loving and compassionate. His mercy is everlasting. Look with me at our text this morning found in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 12. And I want us to try to discover what Paul is saying about us and our relationship with God. He writes, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. I think the struggle that a lot of people have with this text is that Paul says we're to work out our own salvation. We know we can't achieve salvation on our own. We've tried and failed miserably. That's why we had to accept Christ's offer of mercy and grace. So why would Paul encourage us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling? Understand, Paul's not telling us to figure it out for ourselves, but rather to understand that while God has a part in our salvation, you and I also have a part in our salvation. Paul says that we are to work out and God is going to work in. Our part is to work out. God's part is to work in. We're to work out what God is working in. That's why Paul doesn't say work for your salvation. He says to work out our salvation. Paul's already written to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 2 that we are saved by grace through faith, not by works, 
so that any man should boast. Paul's not contradicting himself in these letters to the two churches. He's writing to people who are already believers, already Christians. He's not saying, this is what you have to do to achieve salvation. He's saying, this is what you do once you have accepted what God is offering. I think about it this way. So if I go to the gym and work out, I'm not getting a new body. I'm trying to develop the body that I already have, get rid of some love handles or maybe get some bigger biceps. When you work out a puzzle, you already have all the pieces in the box. You just got to put the pieces together. It's like when a farmer works the ground, he's cultivating it. Paul doesn't say work for, he says work it out. Work out the implications. When Paul says work out your salvation, he's emphasizing your personal responsibility for your growth. Your salvation belongs to you. God is going to hold you personally responsible for your growth. God's not going to hold me, not going to hold your spouse or your parents or anybody else accountable if you refuse to grow in your relationship with Him. God wants you to become what you were created to be. You are unique, you are individual, and God wants you to be you and to take advantage of the gifts and the talents that he's given you to work in his kingdom. Paul says, for it is God who works in you. That's God's part. God is the power for change in your life. He says that I will give you everything you need to do what's right. God gives you the power. God gives you the ability to become what he designed for you to be. I think the problem is that most of us start off really well and then we taper off. We have these great ideas how we want to change. We resolve every January that we're going to eat better, rest more, lose weight, exercise. And by February, we've lost the will to do anything. God works in us. God is the power. And we have to be willing to tap into that power if we want to work out what God has planned for our lives. Let me just suggest a couple ways, three ways that God works in your life. The first way that God works in your life is through the Bible. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3, all scripture is God-breathed in its inspired voice. We hear useful teaching for rebuke, correction, instruction, and training for a life that's right so that God's people may be up to the task ahead and have all they need to accomplish every good work. The Bible rewires our thoughts. It it changes us. If you want to get serious about your spiritual life, you need to get in the book. You need to read it, study it, memorize it, meditate on it. Because the more you get into the Word of God, the more you're going to be changed. The more God's Word gets into your mind and into your heart, the more that you're going to find that you desire to love to accept, to forgive, and to live at peace with others. When we begin to think like God, then we begin to walk like Jesus walked. The second thing that God gives us to work in us is the Holy Spirit, which is the power to change. Paul says, when you commit your life to God, He will send the Holy Spirit to dwell in you. In his letters to the church in Corinth, he writes, You together are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God lives in you. He writes, And the Spirit makes us more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. God's purpose in your life is not to make you rich beyond your wildest dreams. It's not to give you power that's unlimited or to make you popular. God's purpose is not even really to make you happy. God knows that all of that is short-lived. Rather, God's desire is for you and I to be more like Jesus. All the way back in the book of Genesis, God said, let us make man in our image. And he's been wanting to do that ever since. That is his ultimate goal, to change you and me. And God tells us how to change through his word. He gives us the power to change through his spirit. I believe the more time that you spend in His Word, the more God empowers you. But unfortunately, we don't always follow the ideal, do we? 
So God has come up with a third way to change us when we don't respond to the Word or the Holy Spirit. And this one sometimes makes us angry because God works through our circumstances. Problems, pressures, headaches, difficulties, stress, those are the things that get our attention. Paul would write to the church in Rome in Romans 8, and we know that God causes every detail of our lives to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. For God knew His people in advance, and He chose them to become like His Son so that His Son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. There's nothing that can come into your life without God's permission. Paul doesn't say that everything in your life is good or it's wonderful. Paul acknowledges that every detail in your life will be used to help us become more like Jesus. When we have problems or trials or difficulties or rough patches in our lives, those are the times that we wring our hands and we wonder, where's all this coming from? What did I do to deserve this? Is this my fault or Am I just caught in the backwash of someone else's sin? That's why I understand the deep desire to know, why am I going through this right now? But it's also important that I understand that regardless of the reason, God can use even right now if you'll let Him. God can use our pain and our struggle to make us more like Jesus. If we're going to be more like Christ, then it makes sense that we have to go through some of the same trials that Jesus went through. I mean, we're going to have to endure some of the same struggles that he endured. There were times that Jesus was lonely. You know, there were times that Jesus was tempted. There were even times that Jesus was depressed or angry or impatient. And God allowed Jesus to go through all of those things. So why would I believe that I'm any better? Why would I believe that God would spare me from enduring that part of the human experience? Because the truth is God's more interested in my character than my comfort. We read in Proverbs 20 verse 30 that sometimes it takes a painful situation to make us change our ways. I don't know about you, but sometimes I've got to get pretty desperate before I'm willing to make a change. All right, actually, I do know about you. And I know that we rarely change until we get desperate. We don't change too often when we see the light, but we always change when we feel the heat. God lights a fire under us sometimes to get us moving in the right direction. You see, I think that's God's part. But remember, Paul said that we're to have a part to work out as well, so... What does that mean for us? Well, let me remind you some things that we need to be working on, what our part is. Paul doesn't accidentally use the word work because it's hard work. If we're going to change to be like Jesus, then we have some work to do. we got to put some work in. And the first way that we work out our salvation is we choose what we think about. Growth is not automatic. It doesn't just come Change is a matter of choice, and I and you, we get to choose what we think about. Change always begins with a new way of thinking. The the biblical word for change is repentance. It means to change your mind. When I repent, I change the way I think about God. I change the way I think about myself. I change the way I think about others. I change my outlook. When I became a Christian, it changed my whole perspective on life. I began to see things differently. I began to challenge some of my old ways of thinking. I began to re-examine my old values. In Romans 12, Paul writes, Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you want to be changed, it starts in the mind. Psychologists only figured that out 2,000 years after Paul wrote Romans. We have discovered that the way we think determines the way we feel. The way that I feel determines the way that I act. And we're just getting around to figuring out that the most destructive thing that a person who is struggling with depression or anger or jealousy or fear can do is sit around and talk about and rehearse those thoughts. 
If they constantly talk about their issues and talk about their struggles, they don't get better. They get worse. If you want to change your behavior, you got to change the way you think. We falsely believe that changing and modifying our behavior is just changing our actions instead of going back and figuring out why we're acting that way in the first place. There's no action without first having a thought. If you're acting depressed, it's because you feel depressed. If you feel depressed, it's because you're thinking about depressing thoughts. And so the key is we got to change the way we think to set our mind on God and on heavenly things. Change starts in the mind. One of the things you ought to start choosing to think about is God's Word. The book of Psalms begins with this idea that blessed is the man who meditates on God's Word day and night. When we meditate on God's Word, His Word gets into our mind. It changes us. And so God has given us the Word. That's His power. And if you're not spending time with that power every day, You don't have any hope of being like Jesus. Secondly, we have to work to depend on God's Spirit moment by moment. That's where the power comes in. In John 15, Jesus gives us this beautiful illustration when he says, Stay united with me as I with you, for just as the branch can't put forth fruit by itself apart from the vine, you can't bear fruit apart from me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who stay united with me and I with them are the ones that bear much fruit because apart from me, you can't do anything. A branch is totally dependent on the vine. If you were to cut it off from the vine, it's not going to bear any fruit. A branch cannot produce fruit by itself. It has to be connected to the vine. That's the way we have to be with God. We have to be plugged into God who has all of the power. How do you know when you're depending on God's Spirit? I think we figure that out by checking our prayer life. Whatever you pray about, that's what you're depending on God for. Whatever you don't pray about, that's what you're trying to figure out on your own. Depending on God means that we pray continually, pray without ceasing. Your decisions, your feelings, your relationships, your deadlines, your purchases, everything that you do, if it crosses your mind, I think that's what you need to be praying about. You're aware that God is constantly with you. You you practice His presence by having this running conversation with Him. Maybe you have a breath prayer or you whisper a prayer to God no matter what you're doing. You talk to God about anything and everything. That's what it means to depend on the Spirit. And finally, I can choose to work on my salvation by the way I respond to my circumstances. The Christian life's not a one-time event. It's It's a journey. Once you're born again, you don't stay a baby. You have to grow and to develop and to work out the salvation you've been given, not work for. Work out the implications. You develop it. Whether you realize it or not, you're powerful. You have the ability to choose how you're going to respond to each and every situation that you're placed in. If you lose your job, you can choose how you respond to that. If somebody cuts you off in traffic, you get to choose how you're going to respond to that. If you lose a relationship due to selfishness or arrogance or death, you get to choose how you respond. You have this immense power to choose how you're going to respond in each and every situation and circumstance. We don't get to choose what's going to happen next in our life. We don't get to choose what's going to happen next week, next month, next year. But we can choose how we're going to respond to that. We can choose how we're going to react, whether it's going to make us or break us. Whether it's going to make us better or bitter. Whether it's going to be a stepping stone towards a greater and deeper maturity or it's going to be a stumbling block to failure. We choose the way that we respond to the circumstances that come into our lives. The truth is, what matters most is not what happens to us, but what happens in us. That's the choice. That's why two people who are going through the same circumstances, one of them is going to be a winner and one's going to sit around and whine. One's going to complain, 
The other's going to turn it into a gold mine of opportunities. The way that God produces love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, and self-control in our lives is He puts us in the exact opposite situation. You want to learn how to love people? Then God's going to put you around some people that aren't easy to love, people that are unlovely. You want to learn joy? God's going to make you face some tragedies where you learn that joy is different than happiness. You really want peace in your life? I mean, it's easy to be peaceful sitting on a beach or in a cabin in the mountains, but peace is only learned in chaos. You want to have some goodness? God will put you in situations where you're tempted for badness. Self-control? God takes you to a church potluck or lets you in on the secret that Krispy Kreme is now selling Dolly Parton donuts. God allows us to experience the opposite situation in order to help us to grow and to mature. As we get ready to make our way to the tables, I want you to take a moment just to think about what needs to change in your life. What what do you want to change about yourself? The power to change comes from God's power and our choices. God gives us all of the time, all of the treasure, all of the talent, all of the power we need to accomplish the things that we were created and called to accomplish. Real lasting change only happens when we cooperate with our Savior who experienced humanness. We can have a better joy-filled life because Jesus has already given His life, sacrificed Himself on the cross. We're not called to have an easier life. We're called to have a life that allows us to rest in the power of our Savior. And so as we take the emblems today, we want them to serve as a reminder that God has promised to give us the desire, the willpower, and the ability to make the necessary changes in our lives. He does it through His Word. He does it through the Spirit. He energizes our life to make those changes. And He's already worked in our lives. Now it's up to you and me to work out our own personal salvation. If we want to mature in our faith, if we want to grow to be more like Christ, to walk as Jesus walked, as we go to the table, we are being reminded of everything God has already done. And as we take the bread and we take the cup, it's like God looks at us and says, I've done all this for you. Now what are you going to do? I hope you have a wonderful time of conversation around the table today. Never forget how deeply you're loved. It's my hope and my prayer that the more you understand about God's love, the more you desire to be close to Him. Have a wonderful week. Go in peace. And I look forward to seeing you very soon.